Hello, book two. I'm uh, doing a triptych of tags for Tag Tuesday this time around. Tuesday is when we do our tags on BookTube. They're a lot of fun. I watch them all. I try to comment on a lot of them, but I, I don't, I'm not always on a device that will allow for commenting. Uh, but one way or another, uh, I love them, and there have been a, a group of tags recently that I've really wanted to do, so I'm doing them all today. I did, uh, Book Time with Elvis did a, a second travel-related tag, and that took me some time. The, the prompts are very long-winded in a wonderful way. I could listen to Mark's, Mark is, Book Time with Elvis is exactly the kind of booktube channel I love, where the booktuber just sits there and talks to you. And as far as I'm concerned, you can just keep doing that. You can talk forever, and I won't care at all. Uh, but that took a bit of time. So I'm going to try and get through this next one faster. And this is, believe it or not, I'm doing the Faulkner in August tag, uh, which I saw on Brian at Bookish's channel, because people, there's a whole bunch of misguided booktubers who are reading Faulkner in August. I, uh, I don't know where their parish priest went wrong, but nevertheless, they're all voluntarily doing it. They're all voluntarily sinking themselves into the works of William, Fa of William Faulkner in August. And I saw it on Brian's channel, which had, uh, he's, he's terrific to listen to on Faulkner. I begrudge saying it, but I will. And also his video had great commentary from his dog, Ike. So, so I'll leave a link to his video down below. That's where I saw this. Uh, and the tags, the prompts are all Faulkner related, just so that you can be prepared for that. Uh, let's see here. First prompt is Yoctapatawpha County, which is the fictional county where Faulkner sets all of his drivel. Uh, what, con what county do you live in, and what does its name mean? I live in Suffolk County, which was established in 1643. Uh, and as far as I know, the name is just an echo of, of Suffolk in England. I don't think it's the Duke of Suffolk. I think it's just Suffolk in England. I just think it's a, a, a place name echo. You see plenty of those all throughout New England. Uh, Prompt number, uh, the next prompt, uh, the first one is numbered three, the next one is numbered one. Uh, we'll just, we'll just list the numbers, okay. <sighs> Faulkner people. Uh, prompt number one, Benji from The Sound and the Fury is the ultimate unreliable narrator. Name another. Here I want to, uh, hold on to yourself here, <laughs> don't get used to this, but I, here I want to sort of agree with Brian. Benji is not. I mean, he is an unreliable narrator, but not in the sense of lying. Benji never lies. He is simple in that sense. I, so I, I, would almost, I would almost agree with my known arch nemesis, Brian at Bookish, that we might want to come up with a different word. Although the example that I'm going to give is the same thing. A, a narrator who is not intentionally trying to mislead you about anything. And that narrator is uh, the character John Shirting in a novel by M. Henderson Ellis, called Keeping Bedlam at Bay in the Prague Cafe, which is in part about a worker in a giant Starbucks-style cafe combine chain uh, who has delusions about what the chain is doing in the world and what he's doing in the chain. I don't know if the book is still in print. It came out about six years, seven years ago. It's a hoot. Just wonderful. I have it here. This is what it looked like in America. Keeping Bedlam at Bay in the Prague Cafe. I never got a, a finished copy of this thing. I don't think I ever saw any reviews of it, but I wholeheartedly recommend it. It's a hoot. An absolute hoot. Especially, it's not, the correspondence is not exactly one-to-one, -one, but those of you that love the Confederacy of Dunces are almost certainly going to love this book. You're certainly going to recognize it as some sort of literary descendant of Fe Confederacy of Dunces, and it might also answer the question in your mind, where are the other books like that? This is a book very like that. It's very witty. It's very well done. Um, Question prompt number four, As I Lay Dying. Tell us about uh, a book that draws on death or bereavement. I have another prop. I'm almost a regular booktuber here. Is this thing. It's fairly recent. It's Notes on Grief by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. This is a book about uh, the pandemic and about the death of her father. And it, it borders on bathos a couple of times. It's not a very big thing. Grief books, whether it's C.S. Lewis or anybody else, the, the, the danger they run is that they come close to the border of bathos, and that can be a little embarrassing to read. This skirts away from that danger most of the time. And there are some insights here on grief, on the grieving process, on the ways that this author universalizes her own personal grief into a larger phenomenon that are wonderful. I just, I was gripped the whole time, genuinely moved and gripped the whole time in a way that this author's fiction has never done for me at all. I love the part where the author says that grief is an education and then walks you through the explanation of that. That was wonderful, just wonderful. 
So again, a strong recommendation and, and, uh, and all about uh, death and bereavement. Uh, then prompt number two, The Sound and the Fury. Jason the Fourth is the ultimate unlikable character. Name another. Uh, and in, in Brian's response to this, uh, he brings up, at one point, we're going to get to it, he brings up the character of Satan in uh, the Bible. And here, I want to take a leaf from that same book, holy book, and mention God. God in the book of, in the book of Genesis is a thoroughly unlikable character. Uh, he's a liar. First of all, one of the first things we learn about him is that he's a liar. Plain and simple. He tells Adam and Eve, if you eat from that certain tree in this Garden of Eden, you will surely that day die. They do and they don't. They eat from the tree and they don't die. It's simply God lying. He's just lying to them. The threat that he makes to them is just a lie. But he's also vindictive, uh, contradictory, claims to know everything, but has no idea why Adam and Eve are suddenly wearing clothing. He has no idea where they are. He has to call out for them in the Garden of Eden. He can't automatically know where they are. And also, he's incredibly unjust. Vindictive. When he finds out that Adam and Eve have disobeyed the only commandment that he's given them, don't eat from that tree because on that day you will surely die, that was a lie. They, don't, they do eat from that tree and they don't die. And no matter what Christian apologists say about how it's some sort of spiritual death, that's not what God means or he would have said it. And in addition to that, once he finds out that they have disobeyed him, he doesn't just punish them. He punishes their unborn children. Forever. That is the very definition of unjust. He punishes completely innocent people for a crime they had nothing to do with. That is the very definition of unjust. And he does it without even thinking. We're supposed to venerate it because he's so terrifying. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include uh, God here in the book of Genesis. I'm not going to talk about the rest of the Bible. He doesn't actually improve in the rest of the Bible. But in the book of Genesis, he's intensely unlikable. Uh, anyway, uh, prompt number six comes after prompt number two is Light in August. Name a book that made you feel furious and describe that intensity. Some of you will see this coming. It was a Trump book. It's the latest sensational Trump book, I Alone Can Fix It, by Carol Denning and Philip Rucker. Uh, it's a, a massive bestseller, like their first one, A Very Stable Genius was. And it is incredible behind-the-scenes reporting about the final year of the Trump administration. And it's not gossip, like Michael Wolff. Trump sat for interviews with these two very much like the rack of Pulitzers that they have to their name, thought, you know, I, I, all I have to do is make myself clear in order for everyone to understand that I'm the greatest thing that's ever happened to the human race. And it's horrifying. The stuff, even just the stuff that he says on the record to them, apart from all the rest of their reporting, even just the stuff he says on the record, is horrifying. And the intensity of the reaction that I had when I read it was an intense amount of fury at everyone else, at all the other people, not so much the Republican neo-Nazis in Trump's immediate orbit, who want to change the, the nature of this country. They want this country to be much closer to an autocratic dictatorship. They don't want it to be a representative democracy at all. They don't want it to be a representative republic at all. They don't want the people to have a direct say. And in that, they are vociferously agreed upon by a large part of their Trumpist base who were just recently polled and said that they don't think that writing is inherent, that voting is a right, they think it's a privilege, so it can be revoked. Trump could take it away from you if he doesn't like you. And they're not all that fond of democracy. They say it themselves. Over, well over, almost 70% of, of, uh, Bean, 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 stop slurping. You're now slurping in every video, baby. Uh, nearly 70% of the respondents in this one recent poll, and I'm sure there'll be others, uh, said not only are they, are they, do they not think that voting is a right, citizens of America don't have a right to vote, they have to, I guess, it's a privilege, it can be given to you and it can be taken away, and we all know who it would be given and taken away by, but also nearly 70% think that, you know, they're not all that sold on the idea of democracy. They're ready, in other words, for this, for this country to be changed. And it's, the, there are a large group of, uh, of neo-Nazi conservatives in the American Congress right now that are perfectly ready for that as well. They've already shown that they are by this comical gerrymandering that they've been doing for 20 years. That is, in its very face, you just have to look at it to see that it's anti-democratic. But they're on now openly in favor of that. And you can show that if it's ever proven by the fact that large numbers of them conspired with the terrorists who overthrew, who, who sacked the Capitol building of my country on January 6th. A lot of standing members of Congress, you, you already know the list of names, you can rattle them off as easily as I can, 
were in communication with those terrorists in the days beforehand. They were planning, they smuggled in weapons, they, they gave those terrorists floor plans, detailed maps of where certain offices were, certain internal features of the Capitol building that the terrorists knew when they got there and were fed by mem elected members of Congress. It's not so much those people that incited the anger that I felt when I was reading I Alone Can Fix It, but the, the non-neo-Nazis. The, the people who still stand for American values, Republican or Democrat, who know all this and aren't doing anything about it. They aren't doing anything about it. That is infuriating because that's not just kicking the can down the road, that's changing the road. That's ensuring that the next coup will succeed. That's ensuring that everyone who's listening to me that lives in America is eventually going to live in an America that's not a democracy. That's infuriating. It's infuriating to know that the people in this book who have the power to stop that from happening aren't doing it. They aren't doing it. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, as the Speaker of the House and, the leader of the, uh, and a leader of the current governmental majority, could has the, the actual forensic evidence in her hand to have Jim Jordan arrested. Not to have him sternly talked to behind the scenes, not even to have a failed vote on whether or not he should be censored on the Senate floor, but to have him arrested. You, she has the, the actual forensic evidence, the phone call records, to have him arrested, and she won't do it. No one in the Democratic leadership, all the way up to President Biden, will do it because they're all worried that if they set a precedent, it will come back to bite them when the, the administration changes, when it's not precedent. If a dictatorship takes over, there's no such thing as precedent anymore. You're going to be punished anyway. <laughs> anyway, as you can see, that book angered me for a lot of those reasons. Not mainly for the villainy front and center and the center stage in the book. It's a very gripping book to read, but it will get your blood pressure up if you care about a free country. Uh, it wasn't mainly for that reason. Mainly it was for the book. Is, there's a gigantic cloud of satellite characters who could be doing something about this. They have the power to actually do something about this and they aren't doing it. The District of Columbia's district attorney has the authority to arraign and charge Donald Trump for active sedition. It's against the law. He should already be in a court for it. He should be in legal jeopardy for it. All the elements of the crime happened in DC soil in the remit of the district attorney for the District of Columbia. That district, that DA, there is no law that says that DA has to file these things upward to the DOJ to the Department of Justice. There's no law that says that. In fact, there are laws that say that that's not true. The District Attorney for the District of Columbia has the obligation, the legal obligation, to act on a crime committed in their jurisdiction. Donald Trump committed a crime on camera in their jurisdiction. No action has been taken. And in 2022, and then especially in 2024, any chance of action being taken will disappear forever. So those parts of that book really anger me. <laughs> we'll just move on from there. The next prompt is 4A. 4, 4A. Faulkner people. It's all a puzzle, isn't it? It's all a cryptogram. It doesn't have to be good literature. It doesn't have to be convincingly done or well written. It doesn't matter that it's maudlin, that it's modern and sloppy claptrap, as long as it's a puzzle. Uh, anyway, question, prompt 4A is Absalom was the son of David, King David, that's King David to you, okay, who rebelled against his father. Name a rebellious biblical character. Uh, and here, I, to stick with the theme, I would mention the serpent in the book of Genesis, who I might add is not Satan. That is later Christian mythology. The, the serpent is just the serpent, and as far as we know, is just a serpent, is not even a humanoid character. One way, it's just a talking animal, in other words. This is an etiology. The part of the, of the story of Genesis is a codified myth about why snakes don't have legs. Uh, but one way or another, in, in the broader uh, Christian uh, mythology, Satan is the answer here that, that uh, Brian at Bookish gives. Excuse me. Satan is the, the quintessential rebel, and uh, it gets his day in court in Milton's Paradise Lost. But... I would argue that that character, some amalgamation of that character, whether it's the serpent at the beginning, the serpent uh, at the beginning is the only person, the serpent in the book of Genesis is the only character who does not lie. God lies to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lie to God. Eve lies to, about Adam to Adam. There's a whole bunch of lying done all around on the book of, in the book of Genesis. The serpent is the only character who tells the truth. 
says, you know, God has to has warned you not to eat of this tree or you'll surely die, but he's lying. You won't die. And they do eat from the tree and they don't die. And Satan later rebels because he doesn't like the fact that Jesus is being given priority over, over the angels that were there before he was. A little bit of a dicey thing it gets into the mystery of the Trinity. Was Jesus the Son of God or was he God eternal? Was he present forever? Did he predate the angels or is he being given special treatment or whatever? But I'm going to agree with Brian here and choose Satan. Uh, and then prompt number five, coming after 4A, is what is your favorite Faulkner novel and why? They all stink because they're all self-pitying and maudlin. The, all the prose is sloppy, all the prose is overheated, all the narrative structures slop all over the place and go nowhere. They, they are all quintessential, self-pitying, navel-gazing, nobody understands the trouble I've seen, dude bro lit. They are hallmark quintessential dude bro lit and as a result they all stink now i'm not willing to go so far as to say that faulkner had no literary or writing ability i've read a lot of his letters there's definitely a brain there but the books the books are all the crimea river effluvia of a helpless alcoholic so they all stink they're all worthless you if you're an american you have to read absalom absalom or a light in august but you don't have to like them okay <laughs> you certainly don't have to praise them uh, or devote a whole month to them and trying reading through them, rooting through the mud of the forest to try and find some malformed little truffle. Uh, and prop number seven is extra credit. What was Faulkner's nanny's name and why is that significant? Who cares what his nanny's name was and it's not significant. It doesn't salvage his books. And that's the only way that it could possibly be significant. I don't care about this one loser southerner who struggles with endemic racism. I don't care about him at all. I, the only reason that I could be induced to care about him is if his books were any good, and they aren't. So I don't care about any of the misnumbered incunabula of his private life, okay? If you have to become an ite, if you have to become a Hemingwayite, a Faulknerite, a Franzenite, if you have to become an ite in order to like the author's work, then the author's work is worthless. <laughs> the author's work is worthless. Seems like an odd and yet oddly appropriate way for me to end Faulkner August tag. So I'm going to end the Faulkner August tag here and, and leave this be. But I will be back. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.